super humbling to be here, you know, with all of you guys. I've learned a lot today because my background before I created WeWork was in retail, um, actually in the rollout of American Apparel stores, and I didn't quite realize because I haven't had time to think about it, uh, what so many of you guys do and the experience that you have, you know, how much I learned from that process and how much of that I took to, to WeWork, which is, uh, it's been an awesome reminder and also tells me how much more I have to learn. Um, but WeWork started as really uh, an idea about empowering people who had ideas and wanted to create awesome businesses and follow their passion and trying to uh, figure out ways to remove the barriers um, between that effort and becoming successful. And so, you know, a lot of that started out as purely logistic. It just started as like, how can we help someone spend all of their time you know, running their business, pushing their business forward rather than dealing with like, how do they get internet service in their new office in wherever it is? Or, or how do they deal with, you know, Verizon when their internet goes down or their printer when it's jammed or, you know, all these logistical challenges that for an entrepreneur or someone who's a one, two, three, four, ten person business, it's just an utter terrible, you know, ridiculous waste of time to have to um, uh, uh, spend time doing these things that are not, you know, business critical. And so it started out with that concept, and then what we realized, uh, what, what, what was just as important was the human connections and the things, the ways that people could empower each other in that environment, and how important it is when you are an entrepreneur and you have like, or a startup, or even a small business that's been operating for a while, and you've got, you know, 10,000 questions about everything, whether it's legal or brand or accounting or, you know, emotional issues that you're dealing with because you work all the time and your wife or your husband is mad at you. You know, all these things, the emotional support you get in being surrounded by other people who are in the same boat um, is incredibly powerful. And that's where the idea and the name we work came from is this idea that you know, people working together are much stronger um, together rather than being, you know, isolated in their own uh, bubble or bucket or random sheetrock box or cubicle or whatever it might be. And um, luckily, and I was saying this earlier, um, I, you know, we're five years, five and a half years into it, and I think that that's still what we're focused on, you know, now is that exact moment of the entrepreneur, of the startup, of that person trying to make it hustling, fighting, you know, clawing every day for success. Sure. Well, some, give us some context. Influence Group, our company, we formed in November of 2013, and we started in a WeWork. And uh, we now moved into our second location. We have you know, 10, 10 employees, and uh, it's been excellent. I mean, a lot of all the signage and everything that we have here came from designers that we met and people as part of the community. So um, it's obviously been very successful for, for us and actually helped us out a lot as we've gone on. You just touched upon your, you know, your experience with American Apparel before, you know, before coming to that. Were there any things that you're saying that really you feel like you applied from that from that experience into starting to roll out the first WeWorks? Well, there was definitely, I mean, brand is not something that I don't think many people considered as part of the office business. I mean, there are theoretically competitors to us, um, but I don't think any of us would hold them up as, as great brands. And so um, watching American Apparel and seeing how they took an idea that was you know, made in the USA, um, you know, treating workers with, in a responsible way, uh, you know, trying to um, uh, really create an industry that had totally departed um, from the United States. Um, you know, they were selling t-shirts for whatever, 16, 18 dollars that cost them 33 cents to make or whatever. That was a real realization of, to me, the power of brand. And I think that um, understanding how brand creates that value proposition was something that I thought applied to workspace could go a long way. And so brand was one of the things. And then the other thing was, you know, in rapid rollout, as many of you guys um, are probably familiar with, um, you know, you learn a lot of lessons in terms of trying to figure out, you know, how are you going to get whatever, if it's 10,000 square feet of this or 40,000 square feet of that, you know, those supplier relationships and the speed in which you can get mm -hmm. stuff um, becomes really important. And that was one of the other, one of the other things. But I'll also say that, you know, I, being from that, um, ha having gone through this rollout, I thought I was pretty smart. And so there was things like, you know, wood floor that we were paying American Apparel, whatever, $10 a square foot. And I thought that was like a great price because I'd done it a lot. And my partner, who's an Israeli guy who's insane, um, was, like, <laughs> you know, uh, was like, why does it cost $10 a square foot? And I was like, 
uh, because we negotiated it and that's like the lowest price you know that we were able to get or whatever and he said yeah but why and you know he pushed me to go even further from what I had previously understood and he was literally you know going down to the like you know what if we bought it you know off the lot in the forest you know like and milled it ourselves and then like what if we personally employed the guys who were you know laying down the floor how much do they get paid per hour and so we went all the way back to those basics um, at the beginning because we knew that we had a long journey ahead of us in terms of you know hundreds of thousands of square feet so we really wanted to understand every single detail at that deep of a level sure so you said five and a half years, just so the audience understands, what is the square footage now total for, for WeWork locations? I know you probably don't know because you guys are opening so many. Yeah. It's I, hard to keep up. There's, I think 52 are open and they range from about 40,000 to 250,000 square feet. So the largest one is in London uh, at about 250. Um, but I don't know the total, a couple million square feet, but I'm always on the side of the ones that are coming up, so I'm always, you know, mixed up by the Because I pulled it, f the, you guys had the Business Week cover story f in, I guess, the beginning of the summer, and at that point it said 3 million square feet, that WeWork's total square footage would result in a tower 30% bigger than the Empire State Building. So. Okay, yeah, that sounds, more, that sounds more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But uh, actually, that's an important thing, though, because I think that as a company, we don't really care about those numbers. I mean, we never talk about them. Like when Business Week comes in and they interview, they're like, how many square feet, blah, blah, blah. But as a company, we really don't care about that stuff at all. What we care about is delivering an experience. And so like when we have meetings, we're not like, you know, let's figure out what our square foot objectives are. We're like, how do we make sure that the experience is awesome mm -hmm. today, you know? And so um, certainly we have like failures and, and we don't hit the mark in ways that we want to, but but it's not usually because we're like not hitting our sales objectives or mm -hmm. whatever. We're m mainly focused on whether or not we're delivering a great experience. Well, you guys are expanding at a rapidly pa rapid pace across the country in international locations. How are you managing that expansion? You know, with hiring people, are you leveraging technology tools to, to manage that rollout? So I, I said it earlier in one of the discussions um, that, I mean, we, we're constantly changing and growing. I mean, we've gone the last year, I think from probably a year ago, we were ballpark 250 employees and now we're about 750 or so. I think that's right. But so that num that influx a number of people to approaching, you know, 800 has, you know, every month it seems like it's totally different because managing that number of people, the complexity of systems, the opening in Europe um, or, you know, Israel or Mexico or wherever, um, it's felt like we're reinventing ourselves literally like every quarter. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, we're far from it, but we're just working hard at it all the time. And we have people who, you know, we acquired a company um, called uh, Case, which is, was one of the leaders in, um, in BIM technology for, you know, architecture and worked with many other people. Maybe you guys work with them, um, you know, Apple and, and other retailers. But they were very systems oriented and that the yeah. core reason why we acquired them was actually because they were so focused on systems that bringing them in house uh, to influence literally our entire um, company, not just our architecture and design department was um, was a real uh, big move for us because it helped us have people who thought like, you know, thought as systems analysts, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that culturally was a was a huge benefit. Okay. With that case acquisition, is that completely internal? Are you going to look to provide services to outside? All internal. All, All internal. internal? Yeah, and I mean, the scale of our operation, I mean, we're about 130, 40 who are in architecture, interior design, and construction management um, on our That many? In the, yeah, really? Yeah. Out of the 750? Yeah, I think that's about right. And that's with case that brought about 60. So, I mean, it yeah. got much bigger. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the there's no option to give external services because we can barely keep, keep up, up with our sure. own, you know. So one of the themes, and I, obviously you were saying before you sat in a lot of the sessions today, you know, customer experience is, is a big topic that, you know, kind of has gone through a lot of the sessions and talks today. Uh, you guys have definitely really kind of figured out that culture thing. You know, you've got a diverse mix of members, as you call them, like companies like Influence. But well, across the hall from me is somebody that does, you know, as a lawyer, and then down the hall is somebody, you know, you're gonna have companies like American Express and McKinsey renting yeah. space there now. So it's diverse. Um, 
Do you feel that you could scale that culture as you grow? I mean, you recently, of course, you know, had some, some big executives joining from Time Warner as part of that. As you grow, do you feel that it's going to be tougher? And I sent you, we were talking about an article, and I, and I know Blue Bottle Coffee's here. Where is Aaron? It's one of those things that there was an article recently about comparing you guys to Starbucks and comparing WeWork to Regis Office Centers, you know, how... You guys have figured out the whole culture thing, and how do you scale that? Do you find that as you guys grow, it's going to be tougher to, to, to manage, I guess, be looked upon as the, the cool company? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of indicators that are interesting. Um, one of them, I, I got, you know, we aren't very self-analytical, but I guess we did some kind of project where we looked into who we are, and um, it got emailed to me today, and one of the cool statistics was that in our environment of membership, which is something like, 36,000 or whatever, um, I think the number is like 44% uh, female. Um, and that is actually pretty extraordinary in an environment that's, you know, a lot of start entrepreneurs and startups because I think, you know, in the, um, in the like normal statistics of say tech, you know, yeah. startups in Silicon Valley, it would trend obviously way more male. And I think a key to our, to our success is that balance and that feeling that there are people who are doing uh, an incredible number of things. And so that was something that I think we created in New York. It started um, at, because in New York you have people pursuing their passion who are doing so many different things and it allowed for um, so much diversity. But you know, who knows when we go to like Tokyo if that will be the same sure. thing. Like I have no idea how do we attract 44% women in, in Tokyo. But I know if we don't, then the vibe will be totally different. And so that's like, you know, that's where I see, when, it, when you ask the question like, can you scale culture? Like we don't understand um, exactly how it happened, mm -hmm. so, but we should learn and then figure out, well, now that we go to wherever, Tokyo or, or South America or whatever, you know, how do we make sure that, that se those same mm -hmm. things that actually are the core um, uh, reasons we're successful are, are replicated? Um, so I think that's a super interesting challenge. But related to Blue Bottle and, and the brand thing, I mean, I, didn't, I hadn't seen this article, but it was a cool thing. It was like a Google image search where it showed that like when you search for Starbucks, you get like a whole bunch of logos. When you search for Blue Bottle, you get a whole bunch of pictures of coffee shops with people in them. And this, it was similar with WeWork. When you search for Regis, you get a bunch of logos. When you search for WeWork, you get you know, places with people. And I think that's like, you know, how that happened, I have no idea. It obviously wasn't purposeful. Yeah. But it, but somehow it reveals some authenticity, authenticity, which I think is pretty cool. And I hope that again that would continue to flow through. Like our focus on people, our focus on the experience. Yeah. Um, hopefully, because it's authentic, it will it'll flow. Well, connected with us, we went to Regis, and then I literally about to sign on Wall Street, and then like someone's like, check out this place, Charging Bowl. And we walked in, we're like, you know, tear up that contract. Yeah. You know, the, the lease for for Regis. I'm mad at you. <laughs> no, actually, I'm happy, but the Regis. Yeah, we, well, I think our highest, I think our highest conversion are Regis. I shouldn't say that. I don't know for sure. I've heard it before. It's yeah, it before. Yeah, sounds anyway. good. Yeah. Uh, when you first started WeWork, it was actually, it wasn't called WeWork, and it was a green uh, assist. Uh, yeah, well, we started a different company called Green Desk, which was focused on being sustainable and um, trying to, and the real purpose of that was that we thought that people who, like, cared about recycling would be nicer to each other. So, um, <laughs> which, in some ways, I think it's actually true, because someone who actually, you know, is thoughtful enough to be like, where do I put this can when I'm done with it, would also be like, well, maybe I have an annoying voice, and I shouldn't talk so loud when my... Um, neighbor can hear me. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it was, it was something that wasn't only about being green, but also about trying to identify with membership. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think with WeWork, um, a lot of what we learned from that was, was that there are simple things that we could do, and it sounds like really stupid, but I mean, the fact that you know, we build hundreds of thousands of square feet, and we build them from aluminum and glass. And aluminum is like, while it's a high energy material, for example, it's totally recyclable, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it's easy to take apart, you know? And so compared to like building a whole bunch of sheetrock walls, which are gonna be, you know, the, just the demolition is so much more complicated. So there's just some, like, I wouldn't say we're like awesome on sustainability, we could be way better, but we've made some fundamental choices that I think are strong. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, um, you know, energy efficient HVAC systems, et cetera, um, I think we're going to continue to grow in that way. Okay. So back, going back to for familiar, people aren't familiar, so typical WeWork space has the conference room. Some of them I know have the game rooms. I don't think you're doing too much of the, that as much. But the beer, 
I've heard some crazy stats about the beer. You guys provide free, free beer every day in, in there. And when I first, we first got there, we were worried our staff were going to be drunk all the time. And it turns out that I think there was maybe three or four occasions we maybe had one or two, so we don't really abuse it. But I did hear that Boston is uh, going through kegs and kegs every day. So, Yeah, the beer is like a really interesting experiment, certainly in how people, you know, free beer, unlimited, you know, you would think would attract some craziness but well, wait till you open a Dublin location you guys will go out of business well <laughs> <laughs> I'm 100% Irish I can say that um, <laughs> yeah I mean that's the thing you would imagine like everyone has kind of said oh there's gonna be the time when like the free beer but what's funny is that it's it's it, it, there's certain there's just some level of like I don't know what the personal decorum or whatever that people expect of themselves in a work environment I guess which sort of limits you mm -hmm. know like maybe people don't want to get drunk at work because it's sort of embarrassing I, or you know I don't know if that's like the limiting factor but we have had that makes, a couple that makes of, a little bit of sense I, I mean it's like it's logical you don't want I mean you have to show up the next day and they're not like just your co-workers they're they're people who you don't necessarily yeah. know but um, there there was there have been a couple of stories there was one guy who we think took the office space just for the beer and <laughs> literally was consuming like I mean in a week a keg himself and was just that's all he did he came he just started drinking in the morning drank all day passed out in his office and then that was one of out. our guys actually yeah, we fired him <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it happens, but um, that guy didn't last too long. I mean, I imagine if that's his whole business model, he can't pay the rent yeah. for too long. <laughs> but I, I heard your your, uh, your partner or the co-founder, Adam, speak, and he was throwing some, like, how many kegs a, uh, a week do you guys Well, have? I don't know what the number is. I think 100,000 glasses a month. 100,000 glasses a beer which I, a month. That may have grown now since we have more locations. More locations. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to open our own brewery because the market yeah. on the beer is probably killing us. <laughs> you guys can, well, you need a liquor license then in order to, yeah. 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 I don't know. It's an interesting thing. I mean, I think that like with coffee as well, one of the cool things is that we've been able to work with local local suppliers in those markets and you find that there's people who are crazy passionate about that. So I mean, you know, when we've like gone into a market and we like just started with like Corona or something, I mean, people like went nuts like with like you got to be using the local you know, beer brewer, and then there'd be arguments internally, so we'd have to rotate, you know, like one floor. And actually, they have this thing now in our Transbay building in San Francisco, which I think is like uh, seven or eight floors, and there's actually a beer tour that people do, like at happy hour, where they go from floor to floor, and there's, there's eight different beers on, on each floor. We so could do that if Fida has ever. Yeah. Maybe arrange that too. We'll nice. bring it in. Um, so one other thing is that in our location, which is the former Goldman Sachs uh, headquarters there, where we're, we're, we're based, you guys are opening a social club, right? So you're getting into food and beverage now, so you're adding that element there. From the design from that, where do you, where do you kind of go for some of the inspiration when you're designing all the different spaces? I know you, you know, local relevancy is a big thing for retailers trying to not do the same cookie cutter um, thing in each location, and you guys have pretty much, uh, you know, found very unique spaces that you work within. Um, as you open up locations and you're adding the, the f is the food and beverage element gonna be I guess it's the first location, but you're planning to do that into other ones as well? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things. I mean, as everyone who's worked on a store before, you know, if you if you have the opportunity, it's awesome to respond to the local context and the local market uh, and try to make it somehow relevant. And so we've tried to do that to try to, in different buildings. And when the buildings are like cool and they have character, and it was the same for me in retail, it's awesome because you, as a designer, you can play off of that in some way. Um, but in some locations, like where we're in a glass tower, there's really not that much you can do. It's not like you can, you can't really play up, you know, the architectural details sure. of a steel and glass tower. So um, we're sometimes inventing that context and trying to imagine, you know, uh, inspirations or, you know, what they could come from. But I think it, at, a, at a higher level, the good thing that we have is that we're, we know who we are and what we're trying to do. So we're trying to make sure, you know, in every moment when someone is in a common area that they have the opportunity to meet someone and that could be for a business opportunity or a social one or or, or whatever and so um, we're actually like thinking about like sort of micro experiences like you probably don't think it notice it and we're I don't know if I would say we're down we're like social engineering but we're definitely studying like the way that people are interacting in our spaces and then trying to modify our solutions in order to play up 
the potential of, of those opportunities, you know? And you bring up, that would actually bring up a good question because you guys have the mobile app and that's center to a lot of everything from booking conference rooms to registering guests. And I've seen that evolve and you can tell you guys are investing a lot in the technology behind it, not just the physical space. And I can imagine you're accumulating a lot of data um, through that. And does that impact a lot of design? Yeah, so I, I'm lucky enough um, to receive a report every day that's um, called the something like, how did you like the conference room um, report? And um, we, we put on the I get thing. that. I just hit, it just pops up and I hit five every time. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, just because I want it to go away. I, well, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> About half the results are, it's Uber-like. Like, for those of you who take Uber, you yeah. know the thing pops up. You have to put five stars. And if you put less than three or less, they ask you why. And so probably 50% of the people who do the three or less say, stop asking me to rate the conference rooms, um, which is something to learn from. But, um, but the people who do give us feedback, it's actually really interesting because there's a lot of stuff to learn and you realize that it's really not that complicated. I mean, and I don't know how, for those of you who are in stores, you know, if you feel like it would be intrusive, but if you shop somewhere, the idea that as you walk out of the store for someone to just automatically get a, a, a notification that says, how was your shopping experience, you know, in that moment, um, for, for us doing it with conference rooms, it's actually been really illuminating. It's been pretty pretty cool um, because it helps you zero in on little details that you just couldn't have understood sure. otherwise. And I think that people would forget about it the next day. Like if you send a survey out, they won't remember yeah. that they were annoyed by just like, oh, that chair was like a little bit uncomfortable or mm -hmm. whatever, or that, or or perhaps that one chair was broken. You know, there's a lot of little things there that I think are are meaningful, but you couldn't get it unless you were like doing it instantaneously. Yeah. So a topic that we're going to discuss tomorrow morning is keeping up with remodels and refresh. You know, so you're five years in now, very design oriented and, and uh, you know, people's interests and uh, preferences changes, changing a lot quickly now. Not to mention you have people moving in and out of the spaces a lot. So the maintenance, I can imagine, is challenging for you guys as well as you kind of expand and making sure you're refreshing uh, the spaces. Do you have you have you have a strategy in place for that? Is that something you guys are still trying to figure out? Um, I was sitting over there uh, in the nice I don't know where it was, and there was three guys who were talking about that. I don't know if they were preparing for their panel tomorrow. Yeah, but I was like listening to them, and I was thinking like one of those guys has got to be looking for a new job um, <laughs> sometime in the next um, six uh, six months to a year. But no, I mean to be honest, I don't know. That's a really big challenge, and I think it's one of those things that you get like as a startup, you get so much you know leeway in terms of like thinking about those kind of things. But at some point, yes, I mean. Our SOMA location here or in San Francisco is one of our oldest and the members really love it but but we really hate it because it's so far back you know yeah. it's like we, we walk in there and we're just like in pain because it doesn't reflect like who we are now so yeah it's a great question I mean the upgrade cost of that SOMA location we have no frame of reference for yeah. how yeah. to justify is it a hundred thousand is it five hundred thousand we just have no context to even decide on that so, so there's no real timeline for you guys to figure out like you what know, your that's refresh why we need, things like the, the guys who you talked about before that are experienced in these kind of things and have been through it and that, i mean i'm honest about that like yeah. we just haven't seen it so we need like the people who come in and they're like well i worked in this hotel or i worked in this retail and we did it like this and and that's why i mean you know you say it like gray hair and I have some but um, that's why you hire people I think you got a few experience. people out here that can probably help you out yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, it's but it's a great it's a, it's a really good challenge I, from my perspective it's way more in the design and anyone you know who builds stores the amount of time that you put into it is you know and then the idea that it could be like out of fashion or no longer relevant or whatever that's that's the challenge on on my side is like what if it's just not cool anymore? Like, well, what if there's a cooler? Well, that's my that leads to my next question is the competition, right? So I've seen a lot of competitors now popping up. No one, nothing really sticks out. Maybe a, two, a few locations there. What makes you guys? I mean, with this obviously established brand, but what makes you stick out from the competition? If someone asks you that, I think you know for us, and I've, I've we we had it in the beginning. Like if you're like a shared office provider what you do is you take a big floor plan and you divide it up into a bunch of small offices and then you sublet them, right? Like, it's not a revolutionary model. And about three quarters of the landlords that we met in the beginning were like, why, why, should, why would I rent my space to you so you can do that? If you're, you know, why don't I just do it myself and then I'll, I'll make the money that you think you're gonna make? And we were like, 
we didn't have a great answer to that question other than the fact that, well, logistically it's tough to operate. You've got to be in the customer service business. But, but, um, but I think what we've learned is that, and I think, again, going back to brands, it's like the authenticity comes through. I mean, our perspective and the reason why we exist, it was never a real estate model. It was never like, a, a, it, we never even had a business plan. We've still never had a business plan. We were just going based on intuition to respond to a market uh, a condition that we experienced ourselves and wanted to solve. So I sort of feel like, you know, hopefully that will continue to, to come through, um, you know, and whether or not other people have, an, have their own authentic story, and hopefully they do, there are some, um, I think that they'll be successful in whatever their story is too. But the ones that I don't think work are the ones where someone was just like, oh, I see a way to make money. Yeah, I'm gonna pursue that. It's got to be. It's got. It's that will. That also comes through. So I think mm -hmm. as long as we're true to who we are and what we're trying to do, then I think it will. It will. You know, continue to last. So, continue to last. What's the five-year plan for in terms of growth? What are you guys? I have no idea. I don't know if we do have a five-year plan and that's on paper. But I would say, you know, one of the things that I I grew up in um, uh, in uh, Eugene, which is where Nike started, and um, and as a kid, you know. I think seeing the, the transformation of how Nike affected the idea that you know athletes wore athletic apparel, athletes exercise too, you know every whatever their mission is or something. Everybody who has a body is an athlete. You know, transformationally in our culture, that was a pretty um, amazing thing to see that like someone who was not, not an athlete could actually you know put on some Nikes and go out and jog, you know? It seems like a simple thing, but if we look back at that time, it was totally transformational. It was something that now we think, and we take it for granted that like we should all be working out. Um, I'm not at all, but I would, I, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm aspirationally thinking, thinking that about it, yeah. right? Like that's why I'm wearing the shoes. You should, you should take, a sip <laughs> of your, take a sip of your wine on that yeah, one. exactly. <laughs> so, um, but at the same time, I think that's where we're coming from is that our attitude is that if we can help people understand that, you know, if they're in a job that they don't like, that they're frustrated by, that they think sucks, that is not fulfilling to them, rather than it being this thing where it's like, I have to like save up all my money and like, you know, risk my whole life on this, my dream of like opening whatever it is that it's actually part of a spectrum that you know failure is really you know we hear about in technology oh fail is good and then you'll fail fast and start over and all that stuff but that doesn't really flow through to people who aren't in technology and I think a big part of what we want to do is just give the perspective that like you should start businesses over and over and over you should create them you should follow your passion you should work with your friends you should do things that you love to do so it doesn't feel like work and that anyone can do that. Not just like a small class of people that are somehow uh, in, entitled, empowered or whatever, but really that any person has that within them. And so I think culturally that's where I would like to go. I don't know if that takes five years or 50 years, sure. but that's the direction is like being that, that, that thing that signifies you know, that empowerment is really the big picture. Well, how large will that thing be? How many locations do you... Um, I mean, you know, the, I think that we always say wherever there are creators, you know, is where we want to be. So, because you guys uh, essentially doubled in a year, right? Or almost? yeah, I mean, I imagine we have a thousand locations at some point in the near future. Because I think when you look at globally, um, the number of markets so that we scaled, are viable. So fifty-two locations now and a thousand in the near future. Yeah, a few okay. years. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And I know you can't really share too much, but I'll tell you what I read in the paper and you can nod and wink. And, uh, but you guys have a concept called We Live um, that has to do with micro apartments. So it's, it's the concept of WeWork that's gonna have to do with apartments, but you haven't gone public with it? Yeah, I hate the word micro apartments, but, um, but we do have an idea about how we can learn, take some of the stuff that we learned and apply it to residential. And so um, we're working on it. You're working. And uh, I mean, I think, um, at a fundamental level, you know, for those people who are pursuing their passion, one of the things that holds them back is the is residential. There was that guy in New York who was like harping about cheap rent. I don't know if you guys remember yeah. that, but it's true. Like cheap the rent, rent's, and the rent's not, too damn high. Yeah, the rent's too damn high. Yeah. I mean, there's there's history of empowerment coming from from accessible rent, whatever that means, and. Um, you know, for me, when I moved to New York and I lived, I literally like slept on a sheet of plywood on the floor for like, um, I think four to six months. Um, that to me as an experience was, could have been so much better. 
So I think the comparative. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I, it was great, but I, but I think thinking about looking, I mean, people feel like they have to sacrifice in order to pursue their dream, right? They're going to have to like live in a way that's not um, ideal. So I think that's again we're looking for empowerment. Like it's mm -hmm. not about a certain micro apartment or anything like that. It's about how do we empower people who are in that place in their life where they're like ready to follow their passion. Okay. Well, I want to go to the audience and see if they have any questions for you. Uh, any questions? Okay. okay. If you could just speak up a little loud, just because. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, you know, that started early on because um, we really wanted to have a relationship with people that was defined, uh, you know, a little on a more personal level, you know, rather than having a landlord-tenant relationship, which a lot of carries a lot of baggage. Um, and also, we were asking them to be a part of something. I mean, on a simple level, all the walls are glass, for example, so you, you don't really have any privacy. If you're a member, then you have some uh, responsibility to each other to treat that relationship in a nice way. If you're a tenant, you probably are like, F my neighbors, you know, I just want what I want. And that's kind of the attitude that I think a lot of people have as tenants. So we're trying to change that. Um, we raised a lot of money. Um, we were lucky enough, I would say, not we, my partner is lucky enough to be an incredible, um, I mean, probably, uh, you know, one of the best at raising money in the world um, as an entrepreneur. And um, so, you know, we've raised close to a billion dollars, I think. I don't know the exact numbers, but um, close to a billion. Yeah. Um, our last round was about 450 million at like a 10 billion valuation. And that's from people who are supporting us who are, you know, on, on a lot of levels, still individuals as well as institutions. And so, um, you know, we, the, the main thing, the reason why, what's more important about that is that we, at every stage, we said what we were going to do and then we lived up to it. So rather than a startup that might have like some hockey stick growth projection and then it gets 20% of that or whatever it is. We were very real about what we thought we could do, and then we actually met that expectation or exceeded it, and so that built a lot of credibility with all of our investors that we could do it again and again. Um, so we have another you know, end of the year projection as well, um, which we're working super hard to hit so that we keep that you know, streak alive. <coughs> yeah. Mostly all leases. We bought a building actually here in San Francisco, the Golden Gate Theater building, um, which we, we bought personally um, because we couldn't really get it any other way, but it's not really our model. Um, it just real estate acquisition is something that people do for a living, and that's not what we do for a living, so we figure we let the experts do it. Is there not the Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard? Are you guys working on development there? Yeah, and even that, I mean, we started out, so we're working on a ground up development that's about a half a million square feet in the Navy Yard. Um, and we started out as the developer of it, and we quick, quickly realized that we don't know how to do that <laughs> at all. Um, and so we worked with like some established Boston properties and uh, the okay. Rubin family in, in New York, and they're actually a developer and we're just a tenant. Um, but we're like the creative, you know, sort of vision behind the, the whole project. Okay. Um, but that's a ground up, which is, it's also available to other people, but we're only about 100,000 square feet of it. When are they breaking ground on that? Any day. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly, but soon. Oh, nice. It's a short ride for me, so nice. Nice, yeah, it'll be close. <laughs> it should be cool. I mean, one of the things in that, I mean, I, I, I feel amazingly lucky to be in a creative position in a company that's um, so successful, because in some of the conversations, you know, that I've heard today, a lot of times the people at innovation and creativity are sort of like have to battle against the people in development or whatever. And I'm the co-founder and I'm the creative guy, so I kind of get to have the last word. Um, and so a lot of those things when it comes to a you know, half a million square foot ground up building, that's coming you know, really directly from me. And so I, I mean, I, I'm so, that's just an incredible position to be in. You know, I'm fortunate like, to be in that one, yeah. yeah exactly. When you hear some of the sessions going on. 
Do we have any uh, final questions here? No. Um, oh, we do have one in the back, yeah. For our investors? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we operate at a profit now, but, um, but obviously to reach a validation of our valuation, we have to be making a lot more money. So thus the like, you know, thousand location projection, but I don't know exactly what that formula is and I don't know, you know, we have a lot of fun and from everything I heard about being a public company, it's not fun at all. <laughs> um, so we're like thinking about how to prolong that, you know, uh, eventuality to a distant <laughs> point in the future. Um, or maybe new models will be invented. I think that's the other thing that we're excited about. I mean, we think of ourselves as a member-oriented company, and if someday we could come up with a structure that would allow us to sort of offer the company to the members. I mean, there's lots of scenarios, but it's just we want to do all the ones that don't require any regulation. <laughs> well, the final question I have for you is, I guess, on the personal side, how do you manage your time? Because right? I think that's something that everybody deals with you know, for a company like yours, but even for us, small time management's a big thing when you're working on it. Do you find it tough now with the growth to, to balance and manage your professional and your personal life? Well, I, I mean, as many of you have, I have a child, five-year-old, but he's the exact age of the company. So he was born literally like six days before the company, w our first location opened. So I have this really, you know, I had from the very beginning this requirement to, you know, go home early enough to like, whatever, help mm -hmm. with the baby, put him to bed, stay up late, feed him a bottle, whatever. And that set something within me, I think, that was very specific, which was that, you know, I would turn off and be fully present, you mm -hmm. know, when I was wherever I was. And I think that's probably for, you know, those of us who work really hard, that's really the best thing you could do is actually be in the moment and be present. Mm -hmm. um, so whether that's with your family or with your friends or whatever, rather than being with your friends and being on your phone worrying about work or being at work and worrying about your family, to try to be, you know, really, really specifically um, uh, present. And, and so I don't think that the time, I mean, I still work at the office until two or three in the morning on a regular basis, but when I'm with my wife or my son, I like, I mean, I come home, put the phone on the table and barely ever look at it. Sure, yeah. So it's really just about finding that, those moments to be totally, you know, uh, connected. And, and that's been effective up to this point. Um, but being in a place like this, I would say, is also, I mean, I'm going to take up these kind of invitations a lot more often because it's a great way to um, <laughs> get <laughs> out of that, like, you know. We'll be in Miami Beach next year, so. All right, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You know, I know I pestered you a lot to come out here, so I'm glad we made it happen. And uh, like I said, we're members, and we, we, we definitely have benefited from it. And I'd encourage anybody here that's, you know, looking for office space or definitely check out one of the locations. But. Yeah, just to add one thing to that, not to be a you know salesman, but um, a lot of people think we work is for small companies, but our range is actually from I think the largest who have a single office are about 150 people, um, and then there are companies that have about 500 that are located across multiple locations. So I think that um, you know for those of you who will at some point be thinking about a new office for your company, um, we might be a good solution. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, man. Yeah.